Hello everyone and welcome to Access Chat. Today, Antonio and I are being joined by our guest, Jack, and um, Neil unfortunately couldn't join us because United Airlines couldn't seem to get him out of the United States into Canada, so he had to meet up with other passengers and rent a Subaru and actually, or a Suburban, and cross our border that way. Lord forbid that we can fly people out by airlines, but okay. So he, I tell them it's an adventure, but I don't think he feels like it's an adventure right now. So uh, it's more like I'm never coming to the U.S. again, but anyway. So, um, but Jack Mullaney is joining us today, and he is with Micro Assist, and we're going to talk about legislation and litigation, mainly in the United States. So Jack, welcome to the program. Good morning and thank you and good afternoon, Antonio. It's a pleasure to be up with both of you today. Yeah, Jack, tell us a little bit about your background. Tell us who you are. Okay, um, and this, this is a great way to start. So anybody who is uh, listening with closed captioning, uh, I'm from Boston. So when you see the transcription on this, you might hear some words that don't make any sense to you. So you might want to put an R in or take one out. Um, I've been in Austin, Texas for 20 years. I used to work for Thomson Reuters, and that's what brought me down to Austin. Uh, I've been in the, the banking and financial services industry. I've been in publishing, and I've been in, in compliance in, in a variety of those industries. And, and then I've worked in the accessibility industry for the last four years uh, with Microsyst. And Microsyst is a company that has been doing e-learning and training for the last 30 years, and we have done a tremendous amount of work with government agencies, uh, higher education colleges, um, universities, and corporations. And one of the areas that I specialize in is in the litigation and the compliance area because of my background with Thomson Reuters and uh, the legal and compliance area that we specialized in. And so from that perspective, I dovetailed into the accessibility in the news, weekly newsletter that I curate uh, which you subscribe to, uh, which covers topics from all over the, the world. Uh, last night, we had 26 articles in the United States related to accessibility and 25 internationally and a series of blogs and training and uh, job uh, job openings across the, the world. And the purpose of that publication is similar to what Microsoft is all about, is training and education. It's a free publication for everybody to kind of tune in every week to get a, a, a very good snapshot of what's going on around the world. And, and the reason we just wanted to discuss today the litigation aspect of it is so much of what I see week after week, uh, really the last three years, has been related to lawsuits in the United States and how that's impacting uh, corporations. And, and then in the college and university space, you have Section 504 with the OCR and the Department of Education. So there's a significant amount of activity related to complaints and um, resolutions and demand letters and class action suits. So that that's a topic that comes up every single week, regardless of what type of articles I'm looking for. Those are the articles that keep on coming in. Right, so yeah, I hear all the time, all the time about um, I, I used to have this one guy from Australia, he would say, Deborah, stop talking about litigation. Stop talking about only accessibility from the compliance perspective, because these companies should be including people with disabilities because it's good for business and good for their bottom line. And I said, I, I totally agree with you there. But the reality is in the United States, we create legislation and then we take litigation to pound out our laws. And also, even though it's extremely chaotic and frustrating and sometimes ridiculous the way we do it, we have actually created global change with the messy way that we, um, we, uh, we enact our laws and we pound them out. And so because the United States is holding corporations and all entities um, accountable 
to be accessible, um, we have, we, you know, other countries have benefited from it. It's still a messy way to do it, and there's still a lot of problems associated with it. The corporations are trying to comply with our laws, like you mentioned Section 504, which is part of our Rehabilitation Act of 1973, um, that is, you know, complementary to our Americans with Disabilities Act. But there's, it's still very problematic because a lot of times, the lawyers are suing the corporations, money's passing hands, but it doesn't always assure that those websites are going to be accessible and that they're going to really benefit people with disabilities. Not all lawyers are the same. Some of them are really committed, like Lainey Feingold, who we, we've had on the program, and others are committed to really trying to make a difference. And I had one lawyer who is very active on the scene say to me, Deborah, if the lawyers had not fought for the backup cameras on the cars, for the safety belts, you know, we, so the lawyers have a part to play in the United States because when somebody is doing something that can cause harm to individuals, you can get sued for a lot of money. And so That's it's not. still messy, but it's, you know, I, I think it's a, um, an important conversation. And in, in one of the areas that I, I track is the accessibility statements that companies and organizations put up on their website. And when I first started the newsletter, that, that was a, an area that I'd actually have to go out and search and find accessibility statements on companies. And now with the different news feeds that I receive, I get pushed the, a number of accessibility statements every single day into my inbox, which means corporations are really starting to pay attention. Um, I, I can get 20 of those a week, meaning new accessibility statements that are popping up on the web uh, that Google has noticed. And so from that perspective, just that that alone is showing that the needle's being moved. And whether that's proactive or reactive with the corporations, it doesn't really matter. From, that, from the perspective of the industry as a whole, people are starting to pay attention to their websites and what they're projecting out to the, the universe, which is, to me, is a, is a real good sign. Antonio? So, uh, no, let's, if, you, if you go back to the days when you started your, your newsletter, is there a, some major changes in topics that you have observed? Yeah, I, I think, you know, in the United States specifically, the, there has been a, a significant increase over the last three years in the in the litigation type cases. And they, and they have changed, um, I'd say over the last year, it used to be demand letters were the hot topics and companies were receiving those from a bunch of different plaintiffs attorneys. And it has changed to, um, you're seeing class action suits now. That, so it's a, it's a larger group of plaintiffs working with maybe one or two uh, plaintiff's attorneys. And so the, the increase is, is in the focus is larger from the standpoint of how many en entities are being uh, sued. And so from that perspective, I've seen a significant amount of activity in different industries, whether it's the winery industry or the boating industry or the art gallery industry. Um, and so that those, those are uh, as a result of the class actions. Whereas before it was kind of a single shot uh, into one uh, one company with one plaintiff and one attorney. And so th there has been that shift. And in and, and speaking to other attorneys in the industry, they certainly have seen that, uh, whether they be on the defendant side or the plaintiff side. And then from the standpoint of, of number of suits that are actually settled, I, I think that the number that has been circulating for the last couple of years has been 95% of the suits are settled and never see the light of day when it comes to a court. And so from that perspective, uh, companies, I think, are doing a lot of research um, on their own, whether it's with their internal attorneys, with outside counsel, with others in the industry, with trade magazine, trade publications, or straight ahead Google searches, and they're seeing what the activity is saying. And that's what I see week to week to week is there's, there's a tremendous amount of activity. Um, and if you go to PACER, PACER is the, the U.S. tracking of, of lawsuits at the circuit level. And, and the activity is there. And, and Safe with Shaw tracks it, and the activity is there. It's just different types of activity. 
Jack, do you mind um, if for the for our listeners or our viewers that might not understand what a demand letter is? Do you mind? And and you talked about it a little bit, but demand letters. I don't know that everyone knows what that is. I and you you talked a little bit about class action lawsuit, which is multiple um, right. people coming together. But j just for the audience that might not be familiar with demand letters. Okay, so if if a blind individual contacts a, an attorney and, and they agree to represent them until they become the the plaintiff's attorney, they will have in the past and 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 some of them are still doing these types of letters where they're actually sending it to typically the CEO, the president of a corporation. It can it can go to the CEO, president of a school, depending on whether it's a private or public institution. Um, and this letter is citing the issues that the blind individual has had on their website or application and the difficulties they have maneuvering the site and the violation of Title III um, within the ADA. And so in the letter, it specifically cites where the issues have been uh, seen from the standpoint of the, the blind individual trying to use the site. And usually what that means is that they've used a screen reader the screen reader uh, has not been able to manipulate the site and the, the user or the plaintiff uh, has not been able to do the, the type of transactions or the research that they'd like to do. And in the demand letter, it's cited what they would like to see them correct. Uh, they want them to put together a roadmap. They want to have a, a regular testing, automated testing that's going on. They want a manual audit of the, the site to make sure that it gets up to uh, the, the WCAG for anybody who's not familiar with that term, Web Content Accessibility Guideline. Uh, and so if there's violations on the WCAG, it will be stated in there. And then there's timelines um, associated with that. And typically there's training that they would like the companies to do uh, and dedicate an individual within their organization who is going to spearhead this. And and then there'll be money transacted uh, as a result yes. of this from a legal legal fee standpoint. Always, so, always, always, yeah. And, always, and so always. Most, most demand letters look similar, um, and, and in fact, they can be so cookie cutter that some of the plaintiffs' attorneys, if if they what some people call serial filers or complainers, uh, sometimes they they don't do. Uh, good spot checking of the document when they send it out to a new company that they're, they're contacting and they, they haven't changed the name of, <laughs> of the company. The, company that, the other company they were. Yeah. And so, one thing that we see is that there are tens of thousands of these lawsuits happening in the United States. And a couple of weeks ago, we had Alejandro on from the EU and he was commenting that um, and once again, everybody agrees that the litigation happening in the United States is very messy and it causes divides between um, the communities too. But at the same time, Alejandro was saying, I wish that we had the ability to sue corporations that were just ignoring us. I, I wish that we could. Um, and Antonio, Deborah, 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 let, let, yeah. Deborah, let me interrupt you. That. Well, the problem with that, the problem with that in Europe is, first of all, people have to sue governments because they're usually the first ones to fail. So it's very difficult for, for example, in Portugal, we elected someone for the parliament in the last elections that was in the wheelchair. It was the first person elected that was uh, using a, a wheelchair user. And the parliament was not ready for that person. And uh, even if they have spent a huge amount of money renewing that same place in, in the last three years, so they didn't provide facilities for people with wheelchairs to go into the parliament and all the laws are approved in there. So some governments in Europe, in UK, they've done a very significant work on accessibility, even within government. But in, in, in continental Europe, ex excluding you know, Scandinavia, the north of Europe, sometimes it's very difficult for a government to impose that to business because they are usually the first ones not to comply. So, I agree. And I'll no, tell you, in the United seeing, States, yeah, you yeah. have to get permission from the government to sue them. Yeah. We, we have to ask permission to sue them. <laughs> so, uh, like... and, now, uh, and now we have the European Accessibility Act, that is something that came up this year. And uh, the, there's a kind of a, a 
three years to, to be uh, applicable uh, uh, to business and, and, and governments. It will have a huge impact in the digital economy, in procurement. It will have a lot of impact on that. However, there's a few flaws in relation to home appliances, in relation to transport. That was one of the main causes. And as you know, it's 28 countries. There's countries that are more sophisticated on this. And, they, and they, they already have measures in place that go far beyond the European Accessibility Act, while there are other countries who are somehow delaying the European Accessibility Act because they didn't really want it to, you know, they were not really, they know that they were not ready and they see this as forcing, oh, the local business community to spend more money in changes. So there was a lot of lobbies that were somehow delaying this, uh, uh, within this space of the EU, because we were really fast to come up with the, the privacy and with GDPR, it was really fast to implement, and the, and the European accessibility is taking so long, you know, it's you know, it's really taking so long for some, uh, uh, so I, I, I was actually talking about this online, no, no, it's about priorities, I think this is something far more important than GDPR, that really impacts people's lives in, 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 in their own independence. And they were very slow and they are still taking time to implement at this. And GDPR is just something that just happened. So I, I've right. been a bit frustrated with this uh, in, in relation to how f about the priorities that they were giving to one thing and to the other. Right, I agree. And and I know, Jack, I don't know if you wanna comment on that too, but it, it is interesting to watch because Yes, the way we do things in the United States is so messy. And I know that Jack was just involved in a, a legal um, a compliance training that Chris Law, Dr. Chris Law had put together. And they did it um, right after, right before CSUN. And it was so packed with people trying to understand what's happening and, and the lawyers. And Jack was bringing up some really good points about when you Google lawyers and you try to figure out who are the experts. And Jack, I don't know if you wanna comment on any of that, but sure. it was so well attended and it's exciting and it is giving us progress, but at the same time, it causes divides between the communities as well. Well, one one of the the speakers was Dan Goldstein from Brown Goldstein and Levy, and he, he was somewhat frustrated. You know, everybody that knows Dan, he he's he's worked his whole career related to disabilities, and he's done an incredible job. And he was frustrated on the the impact and the progress that's been made with disabilities and accessibility. And one of the comments I made uh, during my presentation and in talking to Dan afterwards. And let, let's just go back history-wise, and, and I know I've talked to you about this, Deborah. Uh, the, the pilgrims came over in 1620 into the great state of Massachusetts, and, and then in 1990, the United States passed its first real disability law, which was the ADA. So that's a long, long time. And so I would think the lawyers in that period of time would have been really, really frustrated, a lot more than Dan was. And then if you look at the, the internet was introduced in 1989, and here we are, 2019. We, we have made actually significant progress from an accessibility standpoint in that very, very short window of time. Now, if, if you aren't disabled, one day of disability is a long time, and one day of not having access is a long time. But if you look at, at iOS when it came out 12 years ago, it what it didn't have the voiceover that it has today. It was it took two years. It was 10 years ago this week that they introduced the voice component and people in the, the the blind community were just amazed that now the equalizer was there with sound and voice and the the ability to use so that's 10 years ago that's and a very touch short screen and touch we screen. were told you could not make touch screen accessible Absolutely. to people that were blind it's impossible and yeah. then apple did it it's like, oh, hold, it. On, hold, hold on, get out of the way, and we'll show you how it's done. And that was 10 years ago. And so right. that's a very short period of time when you, when you look at 1620 to 1990. So interesting, the interesting note, so in 1990, I worked for Thomson Reuters, and I, and I worked in the, with the legal and human resource products. Well, that those were the two product lines that got impacted by the ADA. So if you, you were with HR at a company, you had to make sure that all facilities and, and all 
uh, uh, all, the, all the things that needed to be done from a building standpoint to have employees be able to work there had to start going down the road of accessibility from a, an ADA standpoint with, with the physical. And so what we heard when we were talking to facilities managers and CEOs at companies, they'd say, well, you know, that's, it's awful expensive to, to do my building over to comply with the ADA. And a lot of them said, I'm going to wait for the lawsuits and see where this goes and see how expensive the lawsuits are. And the tipping point will be when the lawsuits are more expensive than fixing my building, then I'll fix my building. And so, I and I have, I've seen that in the United States with the accessibility component. So fast, you know, fast forward here, we are 30 years and, it, and I'm not saying it's a duplicate of when the ADA was introduced, but it's similar. And, and, the, and the lawsuits were similar too. C cities and, and federal were getting whacked for us with ADA lawsuits. And then you started seeing schools getting hit. And then you started to see corporations getting hit. And there's been a similar a progression on the accessibility side with the lawsuits. And from that perspective, I think what I'm seeing now, and I mentioned the accessibility statements, I think we're seeing companies starting to be proactive. They're not waiting for the lawsuits anymore. They're realizing the technology's there. We can make these fixes. They're not overly expensive. And let's just do it. And I'm not saying everyone in the United States, because we're certainly not that close at all, but there is that amount of progress that I have seen, and I know you and I've talked about it. We're seeing companies moving in the direction of being proactive rather than waiting for these lawsuits. And then the flip side is the demographics of disabilities, which you wrote about in your book. You know, if you have 1.2 billion people and the aging baby movement is going to increase that number significantly across the world, if your demographic is that demographic and you're not accessible, you're not going to be able to service them as their eyes deteriorate, as their hearing deteriorate. And I'm part of that boomer group. And my eyes, I have different prescriptions than I had five years ago. And my hearing has been good, but I can't say that it will always be good. And then mobility right. and cognitive issues. And so right. well, it's an economic and factor. For them. And you've talked about that significantly in your book and in your presentations. And I think the CEOs and CFOs are starting to, it's at the bigger companies are figuring that out. It's like, we can't, we can't avoid this anymore. This, this economically, this doesn't make sense to avoid it. I agree. And I, I want to make a comment, then turn it over Antonio, because I'd like to get Antonio's perspective on whether or not he thinks something like this would ever work in other countries, especially in a lot of the countries that he's engaged with. But one thing that I'm seeing that is troubling not only to me, but it's troubling to the really large corporations. I was just at the M enabling event, uh, and Neil was there, and Dan Goldstein was on one of the panels that I um, I managed, and he's a fabulous speaker and was talking about these topics. But what I'm seeing happening in the United States, and I, I believe it's happening in other places, is that the accessibility providers, especially there's a lot of new people coming into the space, investors wanting to come into the space, but a lot of people are still talking about about accessibility from the perspective of almost a accessibility 101, maybe if we're lucky a 202. But the reality is many of the vendors that are in the United States um, are not really well positioned to help the multinational, the national corporations with the gigantic websites. And so a lot of the corporations are getting very, very frustrated because they are being held accountable. They are being sued. They are being you know, the, their brand is in damage, is, is, has the risk of being damaged by us saying, really, you don't want to include people with disabilities. But I do not believe that the industry is keeping up with the needs of these, uh, the, these sophisticated um, corporations or organizations and even governments. And so we have an obligation as the industry to really do a better job. And I think associations like IAAP can help but it's really going to take all of us coming together because what I saw at M Enabling was a lot of brand new accessibility providers, and they were saying some of the things that were being said 15 years ago that don't work. They do not work. They do not really help a large customer get accessible and stay accessible. So if a gigantic corporation is there or any size corporation is there and saying, okay, we really do want to make things accessible, but the vendors 
don't really understand what needs to be done. I think that's a problem we've also seen some vendors get in a teeny bit of trouble when they have been telling their customer. and I'll give you an example. There was a very large corporation that came to me and said, we are being sued, but we spent a substantial amount of money with a vendor who I'm not going to say. It's a very, very large mainstream vendor that is not usually considered an accessibility vendor and we're being sued. And they said, what do you think I should do? I said, I think you should go back to that vendor and ask them why you did everything they told you and you're getting sued. So I think at some point our, our accessibility companies are going to have to really understand that they are part of the problem sometimes as well, especially with all these people coming in going, oh, all you have to do, you just put this overlay on and you're done. Oh, does that make your video captioned? Does that make your PDFs accessible? So it's almost like in some ways, um, we need to grow as an industry. So, um, Antonio, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Deb. I think one of the big differences, many European countries are, are uh, in the concept of what we call social states. So many support services are delivered and organized by the state, including building houses. So it's the, the state that build houses for people with disabilities. They are the ones doing the changes. So it's not really a builder or something that is doing a construction site that does that. You know, I, I was talking with a group in Ireland um, a few months ago, and they were telling, "Oh, when when uh, government when they engage in government about a house, we, we we try to engage with government as soon as we can when we are moving to a, a new house because then they, they they are the ones responsible for the engagement to build a house for us, and sometimes they only engage with us when the house is already built." So, and then they need to go back and do the changes that we need for the specific disability. So nobody is listening to them before that. So what happened is more taxpayer money is being spent uh, in changing uh, the house again, because it cannot accommodate a certain size of the wheel uh, wheelchair. So they need, because nobody has ever asked that person, no, what's the size of your wheelchair? Can you actually go in? Can you move? Uh, the, and the, nobody asks that. So they build a house, they do it in a certain way, and then they, they go to the person, oh, can you live here? Oh, no, I can't. And then the government goes and spend more money. And but so Antonio, the, don't the you all have laws and it, guidelines that tell yeah, them yeah, but, what but, to do like we do? But it's a social state. That's something provided by government. So yeah, but doesn't things. the government have to stick with their own, because most countries have signed and ratified the CRPD, except the U.S. I believe if, okay. if, if, they are, if the CRPD wanted, they can just look at several European countries and they realize that they were not following what they signed. Right. I, can give, I can give you an, another example. Uh, do you know how many people in Portugal have what we call uh, support for assisting living. Until now, nobody had that. So oh. now they started a pilot project, and that pilot project includes 800 people who would have access to uh, to assistance that will help them to live independently. Because before that, people were just in homes. So you could be a, a, a 35-year-old professional working in a company, but you were supposed to live in a home not live so the issue with independent living is some, is a big issue in Europe because we live in the model that is is quite focused on um, on the part of this of governments providing uh, care services and putting people with disabilities in homes or in spaces or, or in care centers that's uh, generically speaking not all countries are like this of course but in many countries that's how it is and there was a convention, I think it was, I'm not sure about one year or two years ago, where they were debating about this model in Europe, where they feel the need to provide more independent living options for people. Uh, but at the same time, there's plenty of private organizations and charities that live and profit from the current model, where they receive an amount from government to have these people in, in, institutionalized in their own in their in their own facilities and, and places. And we that's something in the US we've been addressing for years. And once again, we're using our legal system. I know in Virginia, 
uh, we, um, the Commonwealth of Virginia got sued by our Department of Justice because we were not doing the right thing with independent living and uh, the way we were um, institutionalizing people with disabilities and how we exited those institutions with no plan in place. And, and Jack, I know you, you've seen some of this, but sometimes I, you know, I, I get a lot of comments once again about the U.S. doing things so, you know, ridiculously, but we are making progress. We're not having some of those problems and we can hold people accountable, but we're not perfect and there's still a lot to do. So, Jack, I don't know. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I think one of the, the major areas that, at least in the United States, I, I, can, I can speak to Canada and other countries because, you know, we, I see enough of it every week, but the, the educational side of this, you know, all these students that are graduating from college with with degrees in IT or programming development, whatever the degrees in. I, I sat next to a gentleman the other night flying back from Seattle who's a developer. And I said to him, did you take any courses in college related to accessibility? And he said they didn't have any. And so if all these kids are getting out of college, not understanding a word about accessibility, that's a problem. Because, I mean, I report on jobs every week and the number of jobs in accessibility just in the United States is huge. I mean, I, I do a I do a small sliver of what I see every week. Companies are looking for trained accessibility people, and we've seen it at Microsys and others. Our competitors have seen it. There's a lot of poaching going on, um, and the main reason is there's, there's a shortage of people. So with with every accessibility statement that I'm seeing every week that's being added, and every job that I'm seeing that needs to be filled. There's a lot of activity and a, and a lot of unfilled positions, and there's a huge amount of need. And this this is pre the Department of Justice ever coming out with some type of guidelines or of, uh, of, of findings of, of a new law or a new component of Title III. And so once that happens, whether it's in the Trump administration or the next administration, there's going to be a flood of need across the board just in the United States. And the question is, how do we as an industry deal with that? And so, and then Deborah, to your point about Accessibility 101, when all these corporations really start to dive into it, you know, the ones that haven't done it so far, which is probably about 97% of them, how do we fulfill that need? It's going to be huge because then you shift from a, 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 a reactive legal mode to a proactive, reactive, let's get trained up and let's get our websites and everything accessible within the next 10 years if it's like AOD, A AODA up in Toronto. And, and so uh, from that perspective, I think as an industry, we need to be really looking at how do we educate and train and get people up to speed on this because it's not going to go away and the need that's, is going yeah, to grow. I agree. Yeah. And that's why IAAP is important. Antonio, you wanted to comment. No, it's just precisely on uh, because I've been organizing hackathons on accessibility in in Dublin for in the last uh, three years, and so and we have all sorts of people joining the hackathon, and and often we got we got a lot of young developers just out from the university, and they go there curious and they realize well, nobody has ever mentioned about that I can code, and make my code accessible, it's not that hard. And it's actually quite interesting, but this is something completely new to me. And it was not even part of the classes. No, nobody mentioned this to me or over the last three years that I'm at university. And now I feel that I need to learn because, you know, it's, it's something that I feel that I must do uh, if, I, if I'm coding. So it's not that just people don't want to know about it. Just I think it's, it's important that sometimes a little bit more of connection between universities and life uh, right. in order to make that bridge, you know? That That's exactly what I I see and I agree with you 100%. I do too. And, yeah. And, and, I know and you know, you're... a lot of times, right, a lot of times when we are teaching people to do accessibility, they are at accessible, Accessibility 101. And what we're finding is the, uh, the needs of the customers are getting more and more and more complex with everything that's happening. And I, I saw a sort of a wide bridge between the, I, I found the M Enabling Conference 
conference to be the most robust conference I've been to in a really long time. There was some kind of shift, which I thought was fascinating. And it seems like we're, there's the spread between um, knowledge is getting pretty high. Um, you see a lot of people that have just come into the accessibility field understanding it, but not understanding the complexities and the nuances of the conversation as we're doing here. We have to talk about accessibility from the perspective of built barriers and digital inclusion. And I'm not seeing people do it. They talk about websites, but they only talk about the HTML coding of websites, just using that as an example. They're not talking about the rest of the website because your website's not accessible if the apps hanging off of it aren't accessible, if, the, if your videos aren't captioned, if the PDFs, I mean, it has to be you know, fully accessible. And so the, complicate, the, compl the complexity seems to have gotten a lot um, more robust and the community is not, uh, I, it's interesting to watch the new vendors coming in and um, it, it's just interesting to watch. And then they go and they talk to a large corporation and they say, oh, well, all you have to do is just make sure all of your images are tagged with text and they don't realize even the complexity of what these corporations are dealing with. And I know one large, very large corporation who I will not name had said, you know, we have tried most of the vendors, the accessibility vendors in the United States, and they do not understand the complexity of what we're dealing with. And we're very frustrated and we don't know where to turn. So, and it's not just a US problem, and, but the litigation is certainly pushing the need to get accessible so that you stop being sued but we, our industry is not really prepared. I, and I don't know if we can, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to say the same thing. I assume it's the same way all over the world, but um, I know that we're all, that we're pretty much out of time, but let me, um, th let me give you the floor, Antonio, one more time. And then Jack, you, we want you to definitely um, end the conversation and, and then we'll come back to me and thank the, um, our wonderful supporters, but. Go ahead, Antonio. No, I just want to that there, there are some merits in the litigation that end up making things moving forward faster. Uh, I know I would say that if we had that in some of European countries, uh, people would have changed their lives a lot over the last decade. You know, uh, so I think there's merits on on what is happening in the states and having the possibility of lit, of of litigating. So there are definitely a merit on that. Yeah, and, and that's a good point. And, and one of the areas that I focus on is it's all it's all math. So the the multiplier on websites. You you talked about the various digital assets. And you might have one website, but do you have ten or a hundred or a thousand PDFs? Well, that's the multiplier effect. So you fix the website, but you to fix those thousand PDFs. Uh, and then the other multiplier. You know, and Deborah, I know you've talked about this, and this is a number that's been quoted. I heard it at M Enabling last year. Uh, and I've, I've read it a number of different times. If there's 10,000 people a day, every day in the United States turning 65 for the next 16 years, that's a lot of people turning 65. And the question is, are all companies ready to handle the onslaught of those people hitting their websites as they age, hitting their mobile apps as they age, trying to manipulate a website as they age, trying to read um, PDFs and fill out PDFs for whatever things that they're possibly filling them out for, trying to file for Social Security and Medicare. Can they access those sites on the federal side? On the state side, can they access, you know, constituency type of information? And then schools, a lot of, a lot of people going back to school when they retire. Can they access information at the college level? And so I think that's really what we need to be pushing is, yeah, back to your point, it's not just about websites, and it's not just about uh, blind people and deaf people. It's about people who are progressively having their eyesight get worse and progressively having their hearing get worse and their mobility and cognitive issues, which they never, ever had before. Now, all of a sudden, they have, and they have Parkinson's, and they can't use a mouse anymore. And a company's ready for that, and that's what and, we need to be looking at. Right, and, and, and all of those things that you're mentioning, I totally agree with, Jack. And another reason why corporations care a little bit more about those consumers like me that are getting over a certain ages, because in the United States, they control 60% of the wealth. 
So, so I would like to pay my taxes in my the different states in the United States and certain certainly federally. The taxes should be accessible. I'd like to go into my investments and be able to look at it, and but is it accessible to me? And I know that in the industry that we call people like that laggers. And I was talking to one brand, and I said, you know. It's unfair to, it's really unfair to call them laggers. You can say we're lagging behind, but you, you are not making your materials accessible. So you are more of the problem than people, you know, aging and having problems with this. So there's, and, and I really liked the, the point that Antonio made that there are merits to litigation. There are, it's messy and ridiculous, but there are, and they're not stopping. They're not stopping, and there's some really important conversations happening with the, these litigations, and Jack is right at the forefront of these. So I would say um, we'll make sure that we provide a link to Jack's accessibility newsletter. I would highly, highly recommend. Um, it's a free thing he does. It's, it is a ridiculous resource. I can't – I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he pulls all this stuff together every single week, but – there are just thousands of us that are using this and sharing this information. So it's he's a real asset to all of us because of the work he does. But I know that we're out of time, but this is such a powerful conversation. But we want to wish Neil Milliken uh, well in Canada. And, you know, sorry that he has such a hard time in the U.S. getting out. Um, and we also want to thank our wonderful supporters, Barclays Access, Microlink, and MyClearText for supporting Access Chat. We are so, so, so grateful. And I want to remind our community to please go out and tag and thank Barclays Access, Microlink, and MyClearText because they're supporting these conversations. And we want to thank you, Jack, for being on the show today. And, thank you. And I, and I thank you for the accessibility work that you do because you are single-handedly making a huge difference. So I appreciate thank that. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. And I'm telling you, speaking to you. Have a great day. Yes, yes and we'll have fun on uh, Tweet Chat. <laughs> Absolutely.